Mid-19th century Britain also encountered social and political upheaval. However, even with the growing interest in realistic portrayals of contemporary subject matter, many British artists still looked to the past. Popular enthusiasm for the Middle Ages, which was viewed as a purer, more glorious era, caused revivals of medieval designs and motifs to flourish, although advocates combined their love of the past with new ideas. In 1848, a group of seven young London artists, united by their disdain for the establishment and their love of medieval art, they formed a secret alliance called the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood that painted religious, medieval, and moral scenes using a tight, realistic style. The name Pre-Raphaelite reflects the artists' rejections of academic conventions for making art, stemming from the 16th century artist Raphael and the standard canon of the old masters that was promoted by the Academy. They admired pre-Raphael 14th and 15th century Italian and Flemish paintings for what they considered to be the sincerity and primitive simplicity conveyed by their brilliant colors and linear style, and for a certain beauty and spirituality that they felt was lacking in their own time. They believed this earlier art was more moralistic and real. However, the pre-Raphaelites didn't advocate an archaic revival of medieval art practices without any modernization. Rather, they sought to develop a true-to-nature technique that used modern scientific research methods of geology and natural history. Inspired by the British art critic John Ruskin, who advised artists to go to nature in all singleness of heart, rejecting nothing, selecting nothing, and scorning nothing, they observed nature directly and recorded various intricate details precisely as if all visual data were of equal importance. They also viewed these attempts to portray this kind of visual truth as a moral commitment. Dante Gabriel Rossetti was a leading member of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, and his painting titled La Pia del Tolome is a nice example of the group's subject matter and style. So this illustrates a scene from Dante's Purgatory in which a female character, La Pia, or the pious one, is wrongly accused of infidelity and um, imprisoned by her husband in a castle and left to die. Rossetti depicts a rosary and a prayer book at her side in reference to her piety, and a letter from her husband is tucked under the book to symbolize her continual love for him, while the sundial and ravens remind us of the passage of time and the woman's impending death. The woman twists her wedding ring on her finger as these fig leaves seem to wrap around and pull her kind of back into them. Fig leaves are traditional symbols of shame as they connect to the story of Adam and Eve's fall from grace and their attempts to conceal their nudity. So this scene communicates a specific scene from a classical narrative with a sort of moralizing message. However, there's also a more personal connection here too. The model for Rossetti's La Pia was Jane Burden, the wife of his friend and fellow pre-Raphaelite William Morris. Jane modeled for several of Rossetti's works, but by this point in time, she had also become his lover, and so La Pia's entrapment maybe invokes their own situation as well. The realism and modernity of the pre-Raphaelites was quite different from that of the French realists like Courbet, who were active at the same time. While the latter involved being true to the artist's contemporary time, making direct political references to poverty and social issues, and a deliberately rough and polished technique, the pre-Raphaelites didn't require everyday subjects, but instead enjoyed um, visual storytelling, and they sought to apply their detailed methods of accurate scientific rendering to visualize fictional scenes from literature and myth, and sometimes they even imagined those stories in contemporary settings. This exacting technique emphasized a slow, precise painting with small brushes. John Everett Mier is another prominent member of this group. Now, this is a different Millet than um, the previous French realist Millet. Um, here, he has depicted um, 
Ophelia from the tragic um, kind of story Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, so in the story, Ophelia um, is driven mad after her lover Hamlet kills her father and she drowns herself. So this painting is um, a highly detailed botanical study as well as a scene from a popular narrative. Um, Mie has recorded precise details of individual plant species through careful observation, including a willow tree, forget-me-nots, and purple lucistrife. Um, though at the same time, he's also maintaining um, the plant's traditional symbolic meanings. So for example, the violets around um, Ophelia's neck may symbolize faithfulness, chastity, or maybe just a young death, while the daisies symbolize innocence. The high level of detail in the tight, precisely controlled brushwork convey how the Pre-Raphaelites would concentrate intensely for long periods of time, but the abundance of visual details was frowned on by some critics who expected more generalized, selective views of nature. Unlike traditional artists who used chiaroscuro methods to balance light and shadow, Pre-Raphaelites instead kept all areas of the canvas brightly lit, using vivid, hard-edged colors that didn't bleed or blend together, but remained sharply separated. They gave equal attention to all areas of their compositions, which in some cases gives the spaces a strangely flattened look. In addition to painting historical and literary subjects, the Pre-Raphaelites also engaged with more modern themes. Here, William Holman Hunt presents a contemporary morality story titled The Awakening Conscience. The woman, shown without a wedding ring, is what was at the time called a fallen woman. That is, a woman kept as a mistress in an apartment by a man of higher social class. Um, this is a situation that was prevalent in Victorian society. Um, so Hunt rendered a multitude of visual information here with scrupulous care and accuracy. The wallpaper, piano, clock, and rug are actual furnishings of a Victorian era, not just generic ones. Um, John Ruskin, the popular critic, commented on the, quote, fatal newness of these objects, meaning that their brand new quality conveys the falseness of this relationship. The room has recently been furnished specifically for this mistress. Nothing here has ever been used by a family before. As the title suggests, Hunt shows this woman at the moment she awakens or realizes the supposed sinfulness of her situation. Her moral conscience is rising, contrasting with the man whose arms encircle her and who remains delighted by his life of vice. She rises from his lap and gazes up to the foliage of a sunlit garden reflected in the mirror behind her. Symbols of entrapment appear throughout the scene, such as a cat toying with the captured bird under the table, and the tangled strands of wool on the floor, symbolizing the web in which the woman has been ensnared. The discarded glove on the floor may suggest her potential fate as an outcast or her destiny to be replaced with another mistress whose conscience remains asleep, <laughs> while the light through the window can be interpreted as a call for spiritual redemption. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood dissolved within a few years as a formal group. However, its style of detailed realism endured in various uh, permutations in later art by the group's founders and by others who embraced their ideals. The Victorian era also saw an explosion of consumerism fueled by inexpensive mass-produced objects. However, the transition from manual labor to machine production was denounced by design reform movements led by owners of small workshops, craftspeople, and artists, including the Pre-Raphaelites, who were unsatisfied with the shoddy design of industrially produced goods. These reformers firmly believed in making things by hand with precision and care. One of the most influential supporters of this idea was William Morris, an English designer, artist, and writer associated with the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and John Ruskin. Morris was a dedicated socialist who believed industrialization alienated workers from the objects they produced, and he argued that mechanization had lowered the standards of design and the respect for labor. 
He championed the moral integrity of objects produced by hand and argued that workers who handcrafted objects would derive satisfaction from being involved in the entire process of creation and thus produce both honest and beautiful things. He associated meaningful creative labor with European medieval craft guilds and often turned to medieval precedents for his design inspiration, although he also admired textiles imported from South Asia by British colonial powers. Morris believed in using good design and high quality materials, as well as in increasing the accessibility of art. He said, I do not want art for a few any more than education or freedom for a few. He also advised, have nothing in your houses that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. In 1861, he and several friends founded Morris and Company, which designed and produced handcrafted textiles, tiles, wallpapers, furniture, stained glass, and metalwork. Morris's company, ideas, and design philosophy ultimately inspired the arts and crafts movement in the late 19th century which advocated for the revival of traditional handicrafts and improvement in the design of domestic objects. Um, so here we've got the Sussex chair and the peacock and dragon curtain um, that was designed by William Morris with the help of Philip Webb. Um, the chair here has been adapted from a traditional style used in the Sussex region, while the handwoven curtain is pretty typical of Morris's fabric designs in its use of flat patterns that reinforce the two-dimensional character of the medium. The pattern's organic motifs and the cool blue and green tones are meant to provide relief from the stresses of modern urban existence. An early important commission for Morris and Company was the green dining room. Um, it was part of a complex of refreshment rooms in what was originally the South Kensington Museum in London. Um, again, Morris worked closely with Philip Webb and other associates on this project. Uh, the green dining room has a distinctive blue-green stained oak panel, um, and this creates sort of a calm world apart from the hustle and bustle of the modern city. Above the paneling is a section of green plaster with low-relief olive branches, and then other decorations include panels and stained glass painted by the pre-Raphaelite Edward Byrne Jones. The green dining room is still in use today as the cafe in a now renamed Victoria and Albert Museum of Art and Design. Additionally, many women were employed in the arts and crafts workshops, largely because creating objects for the home was much more socially acceptable um, than what were viewed as the male activities of painting and sculpture. Kate Faulkner, whose brother Charles was one of Morris's original partners, was one of numerous women employed by the company. Her wallpaper design here, um, which is titled Mallow, exemplifies the repeating patterns based on growing plant forms that were very characteristic of the firm's designs. Many of these um, also sort of demonstrate an interest in the forms from medieval tapestries or from early printed herbal books, but they also kind of show a modern concern for botanical naturalism based on the direct observation of flowers and other plants. Here, the twisting stems and complex undulating leaves oscillate between resembling a flat pattern and more volumetric plants. Kate, along with her sister Lucy, also contributed to the production of embroideries, hand-painted tiles and ceramics, and plasterwork decorations. The handmade products that Morris and company produced were beautiful and very well crafted. However, they were too expensive for anyone but the very wealthy to afford, which was something that Morris truly hated giving his socialist principles. Um, for example, wallpapers like Kate Faulkner's Mallow, these were hand printed from designs, hand carved into wood blocks, um, sort of keeping in uh, Morris's refusal to use any sort of mass production. However, this very labor intensive process was also quite costly. Perhaps one of the most influential avant-garde artists in 19th century Britain was the American expatriate James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Uh, 
Whistler was born in Massachusetts in 1834, and after failing out of West Point in the early 1850s, he traveled to Paris to study art, where he was influenced by Courbet's realism. Whistler then settled in London in 1859, where his rather controversial ideas about art kind of laid the groundwork for pure abstraction in the 20th century. Uh, Whistler was one of the earliest patrons of Japanese art after trade with Japan had been forcibly opened by the United States in 1848. Um, at first, he simply incorporated Japanese motifs such as fans and vases within his images, but as the influence really intensified, he adapted the restrained aesthetic uh, that he admired in Japanese art by using a more reduced palette, more simplified compositions, and by placing um, sort of an emphasis on surface pattern in his own compositions. Whistler was part of the aesthetic movement, which was really just this loose group of artists in Britain and the United States in the 1870s and 80s who believed in art for art's sake. Um, that is, they sort of advocated for aesthetic beauty simply for the sake of pleasure and enjoyment. Whistler argued that an artwork should be judged on its artistic merits, not its political, social, or moral ones. He denied the need for recognizable subject matter, claiming the worth of an artwork didn't lie in its imitative aspects, but in its aesthetics. And he claimed that art had no higher purpose than to create visual delight, connect with beauty, and to be the true inner vision of the artist. By the mid-1860s, Whistler had begun using musically derived titles for his works like symphony, harmony, arrangement, and nocturne. Um, this underscores his belief in the links between musical and visual compositions, both of which appeal to the senses. Yet he wanted to make his works of visual art more like musical compositions in that their themes rely on their composition, not their subject matter. So again, he's thinking about art for the sake of visual pleasure, and he's emphasizing the arrangement of the formal or the visual elements in an artwork, and arguing that that can be sort of aesthetically pleasing in and of itself without any outside references. In 1885, Whistler gave a lecture in which he stated, Nature contains the elements in color and form of all pictures, as the keyboard contains the notes of all music. But the artist is born to pick and choose, that the result may be beautiful, as the musician gathers his notes and forms his chords until he brings forth from chaos glorious harmony. And so this is what Whistler wanted to do with his uh, works of visual art. And he's really one of the first to kind of conceive of his paintings as abstractions of reality rather than um, highly accurate or realistic representations of it. Um, so, for example, this work, which is titled Nocturne in Blue, Old Battersea Bridge, it's from about the mid-1870s, and it's one in a series of about five atmospheric nocturnes that he painted. So, a nocturne is a musical composition, typically of a sort of dreamy nature that's rather suggestive of the concept of evening or night. And so, Whistler painted these uh, to sort of convey the sense of beauty and tranquility that he felt uh, looking at the River Thames by night. Um, he explains, quote, by using the word nocturne, I wished to indicate an artistic interest alone, divesting the picture of any outside anecdotal interest which might have otherwise attached to it. A nocturne is an arrangement of line, form, and color first. The central motif here is the Battersea Bridge with Chelsea Church and the lights of the newly built Albert Bridge visible in the distance. There are fireworks in the sky and one rocket um, sort of ascends as another falls in sparks. But as Whistler explained, I did not intend to paint a portrait of the bridge, but only a painting of a moonlit scene. My whole scheme was only to bring about a certain harmony of color. Um, Whistler never painted these nocturnes on the spot. Rather, um, he worked from memory in his studio, employing a special medium devised for painting swiftly in oils. He would thin his paint using a material called copal um, and turpentine and linseed oil, and he would create what he called a sauce, 
which he then applied in thin, sort of transparent layers, wiping it away until he was satisfied. When this work was first exhibited in 1877, Oscar Wilde saw it and he wrote that it was only, quote, worth looking at for about as long as one looks at a real rocket, that is, for somewhat less than a quarter of a minute. So here's another work of Whistler's, this time titled Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket. Um, this one's from about 1875. And so again, the subject matter is rather ambiguous, uh, but maybe even more so this time. Uh, really, this one is almost uh, fully abstract. Um, this work was inspired by a fireworks display over London's Cremorne Gardens, uh, but Whistler has sort of deliberately communicated the sense of ephemerality and intangibility. We can just barely discern the ghostly figures that walk along the lake's shoreline here in the foreground. Um, and again, he's used uh, thinned paint to create the water and the sky, and then he's come back with flecks of yellow and kind of brighter colors to represent the fireworks. So in the mass of sort of shadowy dark hues, vague wandering figures and splashes of brilliant color, um, viewers might construe a myriad of meanings from this one scene. Um, perhaps the sparks are from a blazing campfire, maybe they're meant to be sort of flickering lanterns or visions of far off galaxies mystically appearing on a clear summer night. The questions that this composition conjures and the emotions that it evokes are really going to differ from one viewer to the next, and quite frankly, that was sort of Whistler's point. Now, when this was first exhibited at a London gallery in 1877, detractors deemed the painting too careless, incomprehensible, and even insulting. The art critic John Ruskin really disliked this, um, and he dismissed Whistler's efforts as, quote, flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. Um, and Ruskin also argued that this contained absolutely no social value. In response, Whistler sued Ruskin for slander, and he deliberately used the very highly kind of publicized trial to both defend and advertise his art, um, as well as his commitment to the ideals of beauty and aesthetic harmony. Your book contains a partial transcript of the trial, and then you'll read a slightly longer one for your discussion this week, but at one point, the judge asks Whistler, did it take you much time to paint the nocturne in black and gold? And Whistler replies, oh, I knocked it off in possibly a couple of days, one day to do the work and another to finish it. And so the judge says, and that was the labor for which you've asked 200 guineas? And Whistler replies, no, it was for the knowledge gained through a lifetime. And so the judge ends up ruling in Whistler's favor. He wins the case. However, he was only awarded a single fall farthing, um, and he ended up going bankrupt trying to pay for um, the fees for the legal case. So during his time, Whistler was not necessarily, um, you know, widely understood or widely appreciated even. Um, however, he is incredibly influential. Um, again, his kind of conception of his paintings as abstractions of reality, that really lays the groundwork for um, artists who will explore pure abstraction um, in the early and mid 20th century. <laughs>